with great power comes great responsibility. Compromise where you can. Where you can't, don't. Even if everyone is telling you that something wrong is something right. Even if the whole world is telling you to move. It is your duty to plant yourself like a tree. Look them in the eye and say no. You move. Never step onto the battlefield of ideas unprepared. Before you enter the fray, you need a plan. And there's no better place to get one than right here on Tactics with host Caleb Colquitt. The Situation Room goes live now on News Radio 1440. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome into Tactics. Thank you so much for being with us. We are streaming now on Facebook, Periscope, and Twitch. I have no idea, but for whatever reason, YouTube's not allowing me to live stream right now. Don't exactly understand why that is. I Just be honest, they haven't sent me an email. I haven't gotten a notification for it. I, I don't know what's going on. But hopefully we'll, we'll try to remedy that. In the meantime, thank you for watching us on Facebook, Periscope, and Twitch. And we will be uploading the video, the recording of this broadcast later on for the people on YouTube. Sorry, we can't bring it to you live. Don't know why that is going on. But nonetheless, we do appreciate you being with us this afternoon. And as I'm sure you can tell from how I'm dressed, I am really, really excited about Auburn making it into the Final Four. It's the first time in school history that's ever happened, but it's not just a win for Auburn. This is the first time that any school from the state of Alabama has ever made it into the Final Four. So representing the state, these are some great guys, some great young men, and what's amazing to me is not only did they beat Kentucky, a team that had already beat them twice in the regular season being their SEC rivals, but they also did it without one of their best, if not their best, player. And we certainly do hope Shumo Kiki uh, has a swift recovery, and, and hopefully this isn't something that's going to end his career. It's just going to be a hiccup. But when you tear your ACL, that's hard to come back from, and we certainly do pray for him and his quick recovery, not just for Auburn's sake, because he, you know, he may be done at Auburn. We don't know, but certainly for the sake of, of his career. And I believe he's going into surgery tomorrow. So certainly our, our prayers do go with him. By the time we're on the air Tomorrow, he probably will have already come out of surgery, but nonetheless, big, big accomplishment for Auburn University. I actually went over there just the other day, um, last night, sorry, uh, went over there last night to welcome them home with the uh, when they were coming home in the buses. That was really, really cool to be able to see them hang out with all the Auburn people. There was a lot of chanting. Albie came through. Uh, everybody was really excited to see them. I'd say there was probably four, maybe 500 people. And granted, most of it was students. There were a lot of students there that just showed up, you know, on a Sunday night because they probably had nothing better to do. And it's not like they're going to an 8 a.m. class on Monday. So they they all showed up and, and cheered them on. And it was just a really cool moment for the Auburn family. And this is just such a big win for Auburn. This has been a, a really fun time for us, and I do appreciate my home university making it to the Final Four. That is something that is really good, not only for them, but for the state of Alabama as a whole. And uh, one thing that was really cool, I mentioned Shumo Kiki the other night. Do It For Shumo was one of the number one twinding, uh, trending hashtags on Twitter the other night. And during the game, before they had actually won, leading up to the game, do it for Shuma. I mean, it was just huge on Twitter. It was one of the top hashtags for the entire day. And so Auburn being in the Final Four and, and really just being in the Elite Eight and everybody watching that game, it's amazing to me that really Auburn, at least from what I've heard, is the team that more people are talking about. There seems to be more buzz surrounding Auburn than any of the other Final Four teams, which is great. It's great for the state. Because what that does is, it's because they're such an unusual story and because it's such a likable group of guys, and of course the thing with, with Shuma is, is an interesting story from a human interest perspective. And then you also have the fact that Auburn wound up beating three Blue Blood schools. You had them beating... Kansas, who granted wasn't great this year, but traditionally they're a very, very successful program. And then, of course, North Carolina and Kentucky. And so having that set up to make it to where they are and having lost Okiki and being the only 
team in the Final Four that it's their first time. Because if I'm not mistaken, Texas Tech actually made it last year. Uh, it, it just made for a really interesting story, and that's really where all the buzz is. That's where a lot of the talk on sports shows and that kind of thing is, is going on now, which is great. I mean, it, it puts Alabama, the state of Alabama, in a spotlight in a really positive way. So good job, guys. Couldn't be more proud of you. Let's whoop Virginia. <laughs> that's what I'm looking forward to, and, and the a lot of, of people in the state are pulling for you. Now, it is, of course, the 1st of April. It is April Fool's, and honestly, last year on April 1st, if you told me that Auburn was in the Final Four, I would have said, oh yeah, that's a great April Fool's joke, but no, they actually are. That's what's so crazy about this, uh, but I had to mention this because I came across it, and it's pretty funny. I wouldn't say it's like fall out of your chair funny, but just the context and everything uh, with the climate, I think the Alabama Farmers Federation hit the nail on the head. When it came to this joke, this was their April Fool's prank, the Alabama Farmers Federation Alpha, you know, it's all under the same big umbrella. Uh, they put out this picture to kind of troll the Green New Deal people. So here it is. <laughs> all right. So if you happen to be just listening to this on the radio, um, it says it's a picture of a bunch of cows that are protesting with picket signs. And it says things like, you shall not pass but we will, or Green New Deal, all pass. One says Got Gas in the same font that the old Got Milk logo was in. Um, no gas shortage here. The Green New Deal is full of hot air. I think this is my favorite one, beef powered by natural gas. So it's just a goofy little thing that the Alabama Farmers Federation put together. And it is really, really humorous when you consider that one of the most powerful lobbying groups in the state of Alabama decided to troll in that way on April Fool's Day. So great job, Alabama Farmers Federation. I knew there was a reason. I loved you guys. And the Green New Deal, of course, which failed in spectacular fashion over this past week with not a single senator voting for it. We talked about that in the Daily Dose of Stupid Friday. Uh, it was just a, a great timing. Good job on that. And I have to say as well on the Green New Deal, there were several things that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez addressed in an interview this weekend. I believe it was with MSNBC. Yeah, it was, it was MSNBC that she did this interview with. And it was really hilarious because she was claiming that her Green New Deal did not get rid of cows. In fact, the way that she said it is, well, it is a real problem because apparently cows, you know, passing gas. That's something that is of the utmost importance and Congress needs to focus on that, according to her. She's saying, well, you know, it is a real problem. It is a real concern. And the way to do that is by not getting rid of like all the cows and stuff. It's by feeding them different grains so that they don't produce as much methane. Yeah, I'm an ag guy. Been an ag guy my entire life. And as you can tell, I went to a Cal college. I mean, it's very abundant to, abundantly clear today that I went to a Cal college. I went to Auburn, great ag school. And I got to tell you, doesn't matter whether you're feeding them grain or grass or different kinds of grain. If you're feeding them show feed that has not only corn, but things like alfalfa mixed into it. Yeah, cows still let one go every time. You can't feed them. I mean, there are probably some grains that you can feed them that they'll produce a little more than others, but it's going to be a negligible difference. There's not, there is no such thing as a feed that you can give to cattle that will keep them alive that does not also cause flatulence. That's just, that's not possible. And she also tries to play it off as though that's not what her original Green New Deal did call for. We looked at the art, we looked at the Green New Deal. That is what it called for, and in her facts, questions, and answers that she released, not only on her own website, but also to the media, and sent a copy of it to NPR, it included that the plan was, long term, to get rid of farming cattle, altogether, completely, gone. That was her original plan. And then she tried to backtrack it, and she did so in this interview as well, and tried to say, well, that was just a draft. Well, first of all, if it was just a draft, and she's clearly lying about this, if it was just a draft, where is the new draft? If that was just your first draft that you had sketched out, but there were some things that you wanted to walk back or some things you wanted to alter about it, 
then why is it we don't have the new version of that FAQ? Because that FAQ came out about two months ago and then was promptly taken down about, oh, 24 hours after it was put up, even though it didn't come down from NPR because that's, of course, the media, and they still have it available. And you looked, and that is what it said. And if that really were a first draft that just sort of accidentally got sent to the wrong places, which you should really fire that person because it got sent to the, it got posted twice incorrectly. But if that was the case, you still have to deal with the problem that that was in your original draft in the first place. I mean, who in your staff thought it was a good idea to get rid of all cattle in the United States? The fact that they could even come up with that, the fact that that was even something that was being considered by your people, is enough to cause scorn and say, no, that was stupid. But even if that weren't the case, even if, again, even if that were really the final draft, or that really was the first draft, where's the final draft? It's been two months now, and we still don't have an actual final draft, which is pretty indicative of the fact that that actually was the final draft. It wasn't posted as a mistake. It's just once they realized how ridiculously unpopular most of the facts, questions, and answers, the answers to those questions were, they immediately took it down because they were embarrassed at the political blowback. That's what really was going on. But nonetheless, there was one other April Fool's thing that I did have to mention. I don't know who did this, but somebody has signed me up for a Hillary Clinton text feed that every hour on the hour, they're sending me text, facts about Hillary Clinton's life, and just random stuff like her writing to NASA to try to be an astronaut and then writing her back saying that women can't be astronauts or something crazy like that. I'm pretty sure they're not even real facts, but uh, whoever did that, good job. I think it may be Alex, my buddy, but <laughs> and if you did, that was hysterical. So, you know, well done on that part, but <laughs> it's just, it is really funny. I don't know who pulled that off, but that's a, that, you know, solid prank guys. I don't know who came up with that either on the, the corporate level, you know, not targeted towards me, but whoever set that up. And, and did that, I guess they did it specifically for April Fool's Day, but solid solid joke, guys. I do, I do appreciate a good joke, even if I happen to be the recipient of it. So, well done. I thought that was really hilarious. All right, and another thing that we have to get to. There is turmoil going on in Alabama's Democrat Party, and that was really put on display with a letter that was obtained earlier from Joe Reed. So, here's what happened. The Alabama Democrat Committee Chair, Joe Reed, actually went after Doug Jones in this letter, and that was what was so surprising about it. And he essentially believes, the, sum, the, the long and short of this is, because the letter's about two pages, and you can look it up. I think it's on, I'm pretty sure I saw it on Yellowhammer and WSFA, so you should be able to check it out at either one of those venues. Read the whole thing for yourself. I encourage you to do that. But essentially, the long and the short of it is that he um, believes that Doug Jones is trying to undermine the the, the uh, Alabama Democrat Committee, and he believes that there is a power struggle going on with that, and that is the reason that he believes that Doug Jones is getting personally involved in this election of the chairman. So here's what happened. The DNC ordered a special election for the chair and vice chair of the Alabama Democrat Party. And he asserts that this was done by Doug Jones, that he basically put a bug in Tom Perez's ear and said, hey, we really need to hold a special election because here were some technicalities that invalidates it. I don't know whether that's true or not. I don't know. Maybe Doug Jones either was specifically looking for a loophole so that he could get a different chair in the Alabama Democrat committee, or it's also possible that he just happened to notice it and went to Tom Perez and said, hey, you guys need to reconsider this. I have no idea. But what is fascinating to me is that the the uh, animosity that seems to not just come out in this letter, but has been around for a while now within the Alabama Democrat Committee, which is really interesting. And there is a degree of paranoia, regardless of whether the claim is true or not, that seems to be on display by Joe Reed about Doug Jones. It seems that they do not like each other, kind of similar to what was going on between the Clintons and the Obamas. Like, in the public, they kind of tolerate one another and act as though they're allies, but underneath, they're really at each other's throats and do not care for one another. 
but anyway, so that's what happened, and they they put out that special election, and Reed is asserting that Doug Jones did this specifically because he doesn't like who won the election, and he's trying to undermine the results of it by calling for this special election. And he did so through his Washington contacts with Tom Perez, who is, by the way, the chair of the DNC, the National Organization for the Democrats. And he says that what, the reason that Doug Jones is doing this is so he can usher in a guy named Myron Penn. He's an attorney here in Alabama. And basically, he's suggesting that he wants to use him as a Manchurian candidate, as sort of a puppet that he can control. And part of the reason that he tries to justify this is he says, well, here's what's going on. Myron Penn is actually somebody that is going to be far too busy with his private practice and other things that he's got going on. And so because of that, what's going to happen with Myron Penn is he's not going to have time to do it, and he's going to have to sort of delegate away a lot of his responsibilities. And Doug Jones wants to be the guy in that seat. He wants to be the person to fill that that void of responsibility there and essentially be the one that's kind of controlling the Alabama Democrat committee from behind the scenes. So there's a couple of things that we can kind of unpack with that. First of all, is that true? Right now, we don't really have enough information to answer that question, but here's the thing. Since we can't really determine whether or not it's true or not, I think it's probably wise here to deal with both scenarios and play it out in our head, whether it's true or not, and see what that means for us. So what I mean by that is, if this allegation is true, then why would Doug Jones do that? What motivation does Doug Jones have to gain power and sort of usurp the natural will of the Alabama Democrat Committee? What could Doug Jones possibly have to gain by that? Well, see, that is an interesting question, and I think a lot of it may have to do with if this happens to be true and if this is actually Doug Jones' motivation it's probably because he realizes that his chances of getting reelected are practically non-existent. I mean, barring Roy Moore somehow winning the primary again, which I do not see happening, I just don't think that Doug Jones will be able to win this election. And I think Doug Jones realizes that his chances of that are, are very, very slim. I mean, it's, it's frankly nothing short of... Uh, just groundbreaking that he was able to win in the first place. And that was even against somebody who at the time was being accused of child molestation. I mean, whether you believe it or not, whether you think that it was true or not, you have to admit it was a huge political advantage to Doug Jones for having that allegation lobbed against Roy Moore when it did. And also the fact that D even without that, you know, I'm not trying to rehash the entire election, but there was an awful lot of baggage that came with Judge Moore. And so Doug Jones, I think, is looking at that situation and he realizes, I'm going to have to do something after. I have to set up a plan in case this thing falls apart, and it's very likely to. Like He's got to make a plan for what he's going to do after he's no longer a United States senator. And this may explain what that plan is. What may be happening in Doug Jones' mind is he's thinking, okay, now what I've got to do is figure out wh what role I'm going to play in the Democrat Party here in the state of Alabama once my role as U.S. Senator is gone. And being a U.S. Senator that was elected as a Democrat in Alabama does give him a lot of power and a lot of popularity and a lot of name recognition. But the thing is, I guess technically he could run for a state office, but there's not much chance that he would win, would win there either because Alabama is such a deep red state. So here would be the smartest play that Doug Jones could make. Instead of trying to get elected in a general election in the state of Alabama, instead of trying to hold a position of power there, he needs to be at a place or be in a position that only requires he win an election with Democrats because he's very popular amongst Democrats He's not very popular in the state as a whole. So he has a couple of options for doing that. First of all, he could run for a mayor or something of, of that nature in a highly, highly Democrat-heavy uh, part of the state. 
or he does something in the Alabama Democrat Committee. And that seems to be what he's sort of setting up just maybe as an option, maybe not even his only option, but maybe an option for after he's the senator. So I think that's really what's going on here. I could be wrong. I'm just saying, based on my observation, I think that's what's happening. I tend to say, if it's true, and I don't know if it's true or not, but if it's true, that's the most plausible explanation, that the reason Doug Jones is trying to get his uh, trying to get his claws into the ADC, as it were, the reason that he's trying to get his foot in the door there is because he needs something to do after being a senator, and he can win an election amongst Democrats. He knows he can do that. He's very popular amongst Democrats. That seems to be the most likely explanation, at least to me. There was one thing in this letter that I did find really strange, though, and I, I want to spend not too much time on it, but a little bit. It revealed that there is a really odd rule that I'm sure has been in place for a long time in the Democrat Party, but I was unaware of it. So it's one of those things that this isn't news, but it kind of brought it to light, and I didn't know about this ahead of time. So there is a rule that the chair and the vice chair cannot be the same gender. So in other words, the chairman of the Democrat, Alabama Democrat Committee and the vice chair must be a man and a woman, which is interesting on a number of levels because presumably, and this is the problem, this is the same argument I make with any kind of intersectionality argument, presumably it would not be very hard for that policy to keep a more qualified uh, person out of the position. And I'm not saying that it needs to be a man, that it would be, it could be a woman. It could be that you have a situation in the Alabama Democrat Committee, and keep in mind, I'm speaking from the standpoint of somebody who tends to side more with Republicans. I'm not a Republican, but I side more with them. And our chairman is Terry Latham. So our, our chairman is a woman. So I don't have a pro, and I think that she should be the chairman, honestly. So I don't have a problem with a woman being in a leadership position at all. What I'm saying here is, though, it could be a position where you have two men that are the most qualified to be chair and vice chair, but you get a less qualified person because the rule says you have to have a woman and a man. And the reverse could also happen. You could have a situation where you have two candidates, the, pre the people that should be your chair and vice chair are two women, they're the most qualified, they do the best job, but you can't put those both of them in that position, you have to nix one of them because the rule says you have to have a man and a woman. And so in this particular situation, and I'm fine with it because anything that could cause the Democrat Party of Alabama to function in a less coherent, less effective manner, I'm all in favor of. So I'm not saying you guys need to get rid of that. I'm, guys, by all means, keep that rule. What I'm saying is that the problem that the Democrat Party could experience because of that because they value intersectionality and gender diversity so much, is that it could actually keep a more qualified, better person, regardless of what their gender is, out of the chair or vice chair position. And that, to me, is, uh, you know, is something that the Democrats are doing at their own peril that is endangering them and their re-election bids across the state because of that. And here's another thing, too. In this particular letter, it actually states that what the Democrat Party is intending to do is to reach out to several people, and there's one line specifically that says our outreach to, and it lists a, a long laundry list of things, and one of the things that it mentions is transgenders. So here's my question. If you're supposed to be reaching out to transgender, then why is it that in your official rules you have to have a man and a woman. Wouldn't that mean, by definition, that anybody that is transgender and does not identify as either one of those things would be automatically disqualified? That the Democrat chair, and maybe I'm getting this wrong, I don't know, maybe there's some kind of loophole or proviso in the rules, I'm not exactly an expert on that, but what's hilarious to me is it seems as though, looking at the way this rule reads, that presumably a transgender person would not even be allowed to be considered for the chair or vice chair of the Alabama Democrat Committee. Why? Because it states that they <laughs> have to be a man and a woman, and so one of each gender. And so if you're transgendered, I guess that means that you don't have, you can't 
be in that position at all. So I don't know. I just found that really hilarious. I don't know how they deal with that. Um, they, I suppose it's because the Democrat Party is encouraging the gender binary. Oh, uh, gosh. But anyway, it also, this letter goes into a really strange tangent about white and black Democrats. And, and this, to me, was really fascinating. I'll go ahead and read this excerpt of it. Uh, this is from the letter that Joe Reed wrote. White people left the Democrat Party, not blacks. When Obama won 2008, the next general election in Alabama was 2010, when the Republicans defeated enough Democrats to become majority, a majority in the legislature for the first time in the history of Alabama. Nancy Worley was not chair. Mark Kennedy was chair. But Mark cannot be blamed for that. White people have been leaving the Democrat Party in Alabama since 1948. In 2018, only two white Democrats were elected in the legislature, uh, in the legislature, one in the House and one in the Senate. Okay, so here's the thing. There actually is some truth to that. He's got his history correct there because it was in 2010 when there was a backlash against the liberal policies of President Obama and Republicans came out in even larger numbers than they normally did and that was what part of the, the, I would say, even the biggest contributing factor to the reason that in the state of Alabama, Republicans had a majority in Congress. And so he's not wrong there. He's also not wrong to point out that, as a general rule, people that happen to have white skin have been leaving the Democrat Party in the state of Alabama since 1948, and that sort of reached its boiling point in 2010. So there's a lot here that actually is correct. I'm not saying that there's not, but what's fascinating to me about all this is that uh, when he's discussing this, he tries to paint it as though, well, all of the woes of the Democrat Party have been because white people are leaving. And he seems to, to paint with a very broad brush here in saying that, well, all the white people left, and that's the reason that the Democrats are not doing nearly as well as they did at one point. But here's the more plausible explanation. The direction that the Obama administration and the Democrats nationally, just sort of in general, have been taking moves further and further away from Alabama's values. And that really started sometime around 1948, and it has continued, and they have moved further left and further left and further left and further left. And so his assertion is that the white people left the Democrat Party. That's not true at all. The Democrat Party left the white people in Alabama. That's what happened. Because you, on especially a few areas, and I would say that the four issues that probably I would attribute this most to, marriage, abortion, taxes, guns. Those four things the state of Alabama has very strong opinions on. We're very much against abortion in the state. We're very much against high taxes. If you don't believe me, look at our taxation rate and our tax burden compared to other states. We're very, very much against people taking our guns. And we're very pro-traditional marriage. This is part of the Bible Belt. And so what happened is, and I know that it's unfortunate, but this is just the way that politics runs a lot of the time. People look at national politicians and they look at the national party, and this is sometimes justified, sometimes not, but I won't get into all the specifics. They were looking at what the Democrats were doing on the national level and said, these people are crazy. I'm not voting for them. And they did that even at the local level where the Democrats happened to be more moderate. And that's part of the reason that you saw the big shift from Democrats to Republicans in terms of politicians. A lot of Alabama Republicans right now used to be Democrats. Some of that was also done for political expediency. I'm not naive in that. I'm just saying that the values in the state of Alabama have remained more or less constant, and the voters and what they care about have remained more or less constant to a great degree. What happened is the Democrat Party nationally moved left, and the Democrat Party in the state of Alabama moved left, not quite as far left, but still more in the direction that the Democrats have moved, and they have become a primarily secular, pro-abortion, anti-gun party that is for high taxes and a high welfare state, and the people in Alabama are not like that. And so that's really the explanation for why this was going on. It wasn't that white people started leaving the Democrat Party in the state of Alabama. 
it was that both on a national level and to a lesser extent, but still significant uh, extent, in the state of Alabama, the Democrat Party started moving away from the values, especially on the social issues, that Alabama voters hold dear. And that's a big part of the reason that you saw that, that sort of exodus, I guess you could say. And if you don't believe me, if you don't believe that these are the issues that have alienated a lot of voters when it comes to Democrats in the state of Alabama, you don't have to take my word for it. All you have to do, wait till the next election, or you could go on YouTube and watch old election ads. Look at election ads by Democrats in the state of Alabama. What do they always talk about? They talk about their faith in God. They talk about how they're not going to be a crazy gun grabber. They talk about how they actually aren't for abortion, even though a lot of them are, and they're lying through their teeth when they tell you that. Yes, I'm looking at you, abortion Doug Jones. They tell you all these things. They tell you they're not for high taxes. These are the issues. And if you watch Democrat campaign ads from the state of Alabama when they're running for a statewide office or they're running for you know House of Representatives or whatever, those are always the issues they focus on because they know that their party nationally does not line up with the values in the state of Alabama. They always try to paint themselves as different than the party nationally on those four issues. And so that's the reason that you can really tell that those are the things that alienate most Alabama voters from the Democrat Party. But really what this all comes down to, and this is a commentary on Joe Reed to a degree, is that it is a really sad thing to go through life looking at absolutely everything through the lens of race. And that seems to be what's going on here. Because I don't like Doug Jones very much. I think I've been very, very clear on that. I don't think that I could be any more clear on that. But the idea that Doug Jones, which is suggested by Joe Reed, that Doug Jones is trying to edge out black people and from black people from having any influence in the Democrat Party, that doesn't make any sense. He owes his election almost entirely to black people. And... I don't like Doug Jones very much, but I don't think he's a racist. I've seen no evidence to support that uh, that theory. And so if he were to alienate the black people in the Democrat Party, he would have nothing left. And Doug Jones is not necessarily a good guy, but he's not a dumb guy either. He knows that. And so what I'm seeing here is, and he does say specifically that Doug Jones is trying to, quote, weaken and divide the black influence. That allegation, there's no evidence to support that. And even take the evidence part out of it, it doesn't even make sense. It doesn't make sense that Doug Jones would even want to do that. I think that Doug Jones is power hungry. I think that he does want to have a lot of say in the Democrat Party. But I think he wants to do that by convincing black people that he would be best for them not by trying to usurp black leaders and try to kick black people out of the Democrat Party. That doesn't even make sense. But anyway, that's what the allegation goes. And I think a lot of this infighting and the problems that the Democrats are having both sort of as a microcosm in the state of Alabama and nationally abroad between the really far-left socialist and the more moderate Democrats, you can kind of see that that struggle reflected here in Alabama. And that is because Democrats have made things like skin color, sexual preference, and, you know, for lack of a way to say it more gently, whatever's in your pants, they have made that more important than good ideas and merit. They have emphasized it to the point to where things like character just don't matter anymore. So much of the Democrat Party and who they want as their candidates and what their policies are going to be is the exact opposite of what Martin Luther King suggested. Because unfortunately, a lot of modern Democrats now are judging people based on the color of their skin and not the content of their character. It is really unfortunate, but I do think that that is a fair assessment of what is going on now. So I do have another story that I wanted to bring up Unplanned, you remember we talked about this movie somewhat. I don't think we spent a ton of time on it. 
but we did talk about this movie a little bit before the weekend, and it was opening weekend, so it's a big deal for them. Unplanned has faced several big obstacles in this past weekend, trying to get on its speed and, and trying to get going and everything. And I'll go ahead and go through a few of them. I think there are actually a couple more, but these were the ones that got the most news coverage. First of all, uh, I tell you what, I should do a quick recap before I go into it. For those of you who didn't see the story Friday, Unplanned is a movie about a woman who was the employee of the year for Planned Parenthood. She was actually a branch, branch manager or branch organizer or something like that for Planned Parenthood. She was a big rising star within the Planned Parenthood organization, so pretty firmly in the pro-choice category. And then one day, she actually witnesses an abortion, and it completely changes her life. And she becomes pro-life, and becomes somebody that's a very loud spokesman for the pro-life organization, or for, for the pro-life movement as a whole. And this movie, Unplanned, which, by the way, is playing in Montgomery right now. I'm actually going to the theater as soon as the show is over to go see it with a few of my friends. This is that story. This is the story of how she had that conversion. And so, as you can imagine, it's a very pro-life movie. It's a movie that is made by the same people who did movies like God's Not Dead, so it's very Christian-based. And because of its message and because it's so powerful, there have been a lot of people on the left that have been trying to stymie it. And unfortunately, several of these obstacles have surfaced this weekend. For example, Twitter has been just horrible when it comes to this. The official Twitter account of the unplanned movie was suspended this weekend. And several users retweeted a screenshot that was uh, that the account had actually been removed to CEO Jack Dorsey. And this was not something that only happened with one or two. The account itself was suspended. Nobody could go and see it. So they had a lot of screenshots about it and sent it off. This is actually a report from The Hollywood Reporter of uh, Twitter giving their account of what happened. So uh, Hollywood hat tip to The Hollywood Reporter. According to Twitter, Unplanned was not suspended on purpose, but rather was linked to another account that had violated Twitter's rules. When one account violates those rules, the system cracks down on linked accounts to mitigate the risk of the original banned account would simply move accounts. After reviewing this case a second time, Twitter decided that the unplanned account should not be affected by the other suspension and restore it. All right, so there's a couple big takeaways from this. First of all, regardless of the content of the movie or whatever, to me, it's really surprising that you can be banned for another account that is associated with yours doing something. That is really odd, and I don't understand where the rationale comes from that. For example, if I, as Caleb Colquitt, uh, well, actually, that's a bad example because I don't have an actual personal Twitter account. Okay, uh, the Tactics Radio Twitter account, which, by the way, you can follow me at Tactics Radio. The Tactics Radio Twitter account. Let's say that there was another account that mine was linked to. Let's say that I'm really close with, uh, I don't know, um, what's one that I'm frequent? Daily Wire, I guess, because I repost a lot of Daily Wire stuff. You know, Ben Shapiro, who's on News Radio 1440 from 2 to 5. That guy. If I'm linked to his account because of that, because we're both on News Radio 1440, and Ben Shapiro tweets something controversial, which I know would never happen in a million years, but let's just say that it happened. So, Ben Shapiro or the Daily Wire's official account tweets something controversial, and my account can actually be suspended for something somebody else tweeted? How does that make any sense? So whether or not you believe this is true or not, how insane a policy is it that you can actually be suspended for another Twitter account and what they do? That just blows my mind. And another takeaway here is that they said after reviewing it a second time. So wait, you had to review this case twice? The people at Twitter actually had to look at this case, see that it was a different account 
that violated Twitter's rules and they had to go back to it a second time to make sure that it was okay to reinstate them. This is absolutely insane. And I'm not saying they're lying about it. Maybe they're not. I don't really know. I don't understand how that algorithm works. But they're saying that it happened automatically. But apparently, they still had to go back and with human eyes review it twice before deciding that the movie's account shouldn't be suspended. There is a very, very clear liberal bias here. Even if you believe the account that Twitter gave, it still implies a pretty strong liberal bias. And here's the uh, the other thing about Twitter, because this was not the only problem that Unplanned's Twitter account had. There actually is another one. And this is a video and a hat tip to Steph93065. This is just one example that I took at random. There are several videos of this going around on Twitter of people following the Unplanned movie and then going back to the page and realizing that they're no longer following it. In other words, the system automatically had people that wanted to follow the page and clicked to follow the page. It booted them out of the follower list. And there's no explanation. Twitter has not offered an explanation at all for this problem. But here's a video of this actually taking place. Okay, so you can see there. They followed it and then they reloaded and it had them unfollow again. Reloaded again. Still not <laughs> following. Twitter is not well, letting just... people follow the unplanned account. Now, apparently they've resolved this problem because I was able to follow it over the weekend and it worked fine for me. But something really fishy is going on here with unplanned and Twitter. And I don't think that it's a coincidence that Twitter has a very far left-leaning bend. I mean, keep in mind that their owner, uh, their owner has expressed very leftist views. And Twitter has a, a pretty long history of censoring conservatives. Granted, they've not been as bad as some of the other platforms. Uh, YouTube comes to mind pretty quickly. But Twitter has been pretty bad about this. And so, unfortunately... This is something that has happened. And accounts have been accidentally suspended before for, you know, seemingly accidental reasons. So even though I don't believe that it was an accident based on some of the surrounding evidence and based on the explanation they get, gave, I don't actually believe that it was an accident. However, it's not outside the realm of possibility that that could happen. I've never heard of a bug where people follow a particular organization or account on Twitter, and then automatically it unfollows you. It, it takes your followership, I guess you were to call it, off. I've never seen that happen. I've never seen it happen to me. I've never even heard of it happening to other people. And this wasn't just one person that had a glitch. There were dozens and dozens of people saying that they were having this issue. And so it seems to me not a coincidence at all that this particular movie, Unplanned, that its account has gone down so many times and people are having a hard time following it. And that's the thing. I don't remember this same mistake happening with movies like Moonlight, which was about a gay, uh, gay director. I don't remember this happening with movies like Vice, which was essentially Hollywood's manufactured hit piece against Vice President Dick Cheney. I don't remember this happening with movies like uh, Call Me By Your Name, which glorified homosexuality and pedophilia. I don't remember any of these problems happening with those movies that had a very clear left-leaning bend. And yet it seems to continuously happen with this movie that has a pro-life message. I don't think that's a coincidence. And I think stuff like this is the exact reason that people get a little bit paranoid when they talk about censorship on Facebook and, and Twitter and all the other social media platforms. Because it seems as though when these accidental suspensions happen, they always only happen to people on the right. That seems to be the, the going trend here. And by the way, this was unfortunately not the only obstacle that faced unplanned this weekend. TV networks actually refused to run their ads. 
and the TV networks that refused, Fox News thankfully said that they would, but all the other networks that they tried to get their ads on said that they would not. So Lifetime, Hallmark, USA Network, HGTV, Travel Channel, Cooking Channel, Lifetime, and the Food Network all refused. All of them. For whatever reason, they said that they did not want to air the ads of this movie Unplanned. And there's a couple different reasons. A couple of them gave different explanations. A few said that they would not rate it, uh, put it on the air because it's an R-rated film, which is a massive pain in the butt because based on what I've heard from people that have seen this movie, and again, I'm going to see it right after the show tonight, there's really no reason that this should be an R-rated film except for that one scene in the abortion clinic. And everything takes place on a monitor. It's showing the dismemberment of a child which is a horrific thing but at the same time it's happening on a monitor now here's the irony in all of this i actually think that the r rating is probably not unjustified in and of itself and what i mean by that is a movie that features a doctor and i'll use that term very loosely here a a person going in and sorry i don't know why that's happening uh somebody actually going in and murdering a child on screen is very traumatic and probably should merit an r rating but the hollywood people don't even believe it's a person and so they're in a catch-22 that if they gave it this r rating the obvious impl uh the obvious thing that they are implying here is that the abortion is a violent, graphic, and traumatizing act enough to merit keeping anybody under the age of 17 out of the theaters. So the irony is they could either downplay it and say, okay, well, abortion's not an act of violence, and it's not something that's traumatic, and it's not something that's hard to watch, and it's just a clump of cells anyway, so it doesn't matter. So what we're going to do is we'll just give it a PG rating, whatever. But they didn't want to do that because they knew that an R rating would deter, like we're seeing here, certain TV networks from running its ads and also kind of keep teenagers out of it and also make some Christians a little skeptical about going to see it, which is the core audience, of course. So in a ploy, I believe to hurt the movie, they gave it an R rating. But the irony is, if you're extrapolating it logically, what they are saying by giving this movie an R rating is that an abortion is a horrific thing to behold. And the truth is, they're exactly right on that. But anyway, if a network has a policy that we just don't run ads for our movies, it's kind of a pain in the butt because of the situation. But at least I understand the rule, and they're not, they're not specifically trying to hedge out this one movie because it has messages that they may disagree with. So at least I understand it from that perspective. However, there were a lot of these networks that didn't even offer that as an explanation. They said that it was, quote, the sensitive nature of the film. That came from Travel Channel, Cooking Channel, HGTV, Food Network, and Lifetime. They all said, well, it was sensitive, and that's the reason that we didn't want to run the ads. And it is just absolutely appalling to me that because of a, they don't like the political nature of the message that this movie is showing, that they are willing to forego trailers for this movie. And here's the thing that I would also ask. And I'm not trying to start a boycott or anything like that. But if you think about it from that perspective, especially the channels that we just listed, a lot of them, Hallmark, Lifetime, HGTV, Cooking Food, those tend to be networks that have a pretty strong family and Christian base of fans. I don't think it's a smart business idea 
to deny this particular ad specifically because of that, because there are going to be some people, and I'm not saying that you should or that it's immoral if you don't or anything like that. This is not a call to action. But I'm just saying that if I were in charge of those networks, I would seriously reconsider that because I know that my audience may not be too pleased with me, since they are my core audience, after not showing just the ad for a movie that they may go to when they find out that you specifically didn't want that movie's ads on your television station. That to me seems like a very risky business proposition. But anyway, we saw actually the same thing happen with the movie Gosnell. You'll remember that Gosnell was about the, I mean, just the absolute horror show that was going on in the Kermit Gosnell abortion clinic, the one that he ran. And because of that, and because that movie showed sort of the, the really dark underbelly of the abortion industry, there were a lot of programs, there were a lot of TV stations that wouldn't run their ads either. And so you do have TV stations, which they're a private, they're a private company, they have the right to do it if they want to, but it seems to me unwise for them to do so. And we saw the same thing happen with that movie as well. However, there is great news. Despite all these roadblocks, despite having the deck stacked against them, this movie way exceeded at expectations for opening weekend. They were guessing, based on their estimates, that you're probably going to see about $3 million out of this movie. They were expecting to make $3 million. What they actually made was $6.1 million. So more than double what they were expecting to see on opening weekend. And it became the number five movie in America behind Dumbo, Us, Captain Marvel, and Five Feet Apart. Now, number five doesn't seem like a huge deal. But you have to keep in mind what it's up against here. This movie, Unplanned, had a $6 million budget which, by the way, means that they have already, on their first opening weekend, turned a profit because they made $6.1 So from now on, everything they make is profit. They've already covered their costs, and now it's just time to make profit. And so, really good news for them. But when you look at its budget compared to some of the other movies, for example, Dumbo had a $170 million budget. $170 million. That is 28 times the $6 million budget of Unplanned. Captain Marvel, $152 million, 25 times the budget of Unplanned. And yet, I mean, it's not exactly close. It's not exactly like Unplanned almost beat those movies. But what I'm saying is you have to keep in mind that it's, it's going up against a movie with way more budget than it ever thought about having. And here's another thing you also have to consider. Not only is money a factor in this, and not only is it a factor that Twitter was trying to delete their account, and you had TV stations that refused to run advertising for it, so it was only advertised on one channel in the entire country. Here's something else to consider. The number of theaters that were carrying the movie in the first place because that makes a pretty big difference. So to compare, Unplanned was featured in 1,059 theaters this weekend, one of them being the AMC right here in Montgomery where I'm going to see the film. Dumbo was featured in 4,259, four times, four times the amount of theaters. And uh, it also beat out, Captain Marvel had about four times as many. And then you also had Wonder Park, who actually finished behind Unplanned, didn't make quite as much money as Unplanned did. And it was featured in 3,304 theaters. So over three times the amount of theaters that Unplanned was featured in, and yet Unplanned still beat it. With a lower budget, with less theaters, it still made more money. So this is actually really encouraging that despite everything stacked against it, despite everybody trying to quash this film, it's having an impact and a lot of people are going to see it. And I think that this does say something too. There are a lot of times 
that we see in the biblical narrative, God does really, truly amazing things with very little. And usually when the deck is stacked against him and stacked against his people. And I really do believe that this is yet another example of this. I mean, the God that can take down the most powerful nation on earth with one guy and a stick in the form of Moses and his staff, he can make a movie do better. And I do hope that this movie changes the hearts and minds of those that go to see it. And I'm praying for this movie and I'm asking you to pray for this movie as well because I think that it can have enough impact on people that maybe we can start turning this around. It's been trending down for a while. The pro-life movement has had amazing gains since really about 1992, 1993, but it's been slow and it's been very gradual. Maybe this movie makes it into a tidal wave. I don't know. But I know that God is going to hold us accountable for what we do. And I'm really praying that this movie might start changing everything around for this country. So please pray for this movie. Pray for its success. Pray for movies like it that promote a pro-life, pro-God message to continue to be made. And go see the movie. Maybe go see it even a couple times if you want to. Because we really do need to support efforts like this. And I'm going to do my part in that. Because I do believe in practicing what I preach. And so because of that, those networks that have a lot of viewers are not going to run their ads. And I know that it probably won't help all that much. But I'm going to run their ad. Because I do want to do my part. I'm running the full trailer, the two and a half minute trailer. Uh, and I'm doing it pro bono. I got in touch with them about running their ads and I'm doing this ad completely for free, not getting any money out of the unplanned movie for this. So I'm just doing this because I think it's the right thing to do. And uh, we'll be back with our show in just a second. But in the meantime, enjoy this trailer. Abby Johnson is in the other room. Here. Our first order of business is to present Planned Parenthood's Employee of the Year Award. Abby Johnson. There's a fire inside, you can feel this is Abby. She's our newest volunteer escort. Abby, this is Cheryl Alessandro. I'd be the youngest director in Planned Parenthood history. You'll actually be in charge of the abortions at your clinic. I have a chance to make a real difference. No matter what you do for the rest of your life, you're still going to be a baby killer. The only thing that's changed is you, Abby. Can you even hear yourself talk right now about these procedures? These are little babies. I'm not going to apologize for doing a job that helps women in crisis. There's still a part of me that isn't sure. I know. But the one thing that all experts agree on is that at this stage, the fetus can't feel anything. Sorry to bother you, but they need an extra person in the back room. Are you free? and fighting for his life. We commend the souls of these hundreds of children. And Lord, we pray to end abortion. I really appreciate what you've done for us. I'll not forget it. 22,000 abortions. How do I even comprehend that? Rough day at the office. You can say that. You're making a mess. To your dad and me, you are our baby from the moment of conception. We are paying you to be a perfect instrument of corporate policy. We are an abortion provider. I can't be a part of this anymore. Everything that they told us is a lie. Don't underestimate the repercussions of this. You gotta be careful. Rhonda, please don't do this! Rhonda! Let me tell you what's gonna happen if you walk through that door. Congratulations. You have made an enemy of one of the most powerful organizations on the planet. All right, so like I said, I do encourage you to go and to see that. <clears throat> but, excuse me, I actually have to go see it myself here in just a little bit, so we're going to go ahead and go to the daily dose of stupid. Now you messed it up. <laughs> You're stupid. 
Okay, today's Daily Dose of Stupid yet again has to do with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She is a wonderful fountain of stupid that continues to spew out stupid on a daily basis. And as long as she's continuing to provide the stupid, we're going to continue pointing it out. So let's go ahead and go to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Really needs to brush up on her history here. Let's go to uh, her talking about FDR. When our party was boldest, the time of the New, New Deal, the Great Society, the Civil Rights Act, and so on, we had and carried super majorities in the House, in the Senate. We carried the presidency. They had to amend the Constitution of the United States to make sure Roosevelt did not get reelected. And, uh, we, you know, there were so many extraordinary things that were happening in that time that were uniting working people. All right, so did you spot the problem in that little statement? There's a couple of things, but I also wanted you to uh, notice in that video that if you're watching the people on looking, right when she says something completely wrong, there are the imbeciles behind her just nodding along. Yep, yep, that's right. So apparently her audience, which we all pretty much knew this, is just as ignorant as she is. But... She asserts that the 22nd Amendment, even though she doesn't say that it's the 22nd Amendment, we know that that's what she's talking about, about uh, presidential term limits, that that is what kept FDR from running again. There's only one problem with that. FDR died in 1945. The Second Amendment was ratified in 1951. By the way, Alabama, the last state to ratify that amendment to the Constitution, Therefore, you know, little personal tie there. But it's just funny to me that she is asserting that an amendment that was not ratified in the Constitution until six years after the man died is what kept FDR from getting a, I guess that would have been a fifth term. But anyway, it just shows she knows nothing about history. Even when she's talking about the history of her own party, she has no idea what's going on. But here's what's so funny about this. Let's pretend that she was not historically wrong. Let's just say that you take the actual facts out of it and pretend that what she's saying wasn't incorrect. Even if it wasn't factually incorrect, which it clearly is, because I, I guess she assumed that FDR was going to rise from the grave and run for another <laughs> term as, uh, I don't know, maybe she'd been watching way too much Walking Dead at this point. I'm not sure. But anyway... Even if you take that part out of the equation and her having her dates wrong, even what she's saying doesn't make sense. It doesn't ha even have a sense of logical consistency within her own statement, even if you don't look to anything else to fact check her. Why? Because she's saying it was at this time where we were having like super majorities in the Senate and super majorities in the, the House of Representatives. And, uh, and they passed an amendment to keep FDR from running for president again. Um, yeah, well, if the Democrats had supermajorities in the House and the Senate, as you're claiming, and, and by the way, she's actually correct on that, they did have really big majorities in both houses of Congress when that was taking place. Well, then how the heck did Republicans get an amendment to the Constitution passed? Because that's not even a majority vote. That's a much higher bar when it comes to the amount of votes that you need in the House and the Senate to get that ball rolling. And yet she's asserting that the Republicans are the problem because they're the ones that passed an amendment in a Democrat-controlled House and Senate to keep FDR from getting into... It doesn't even make sense even if you take out the fact that she's completely wrong on the facts. Even if you just were to observe her statement in a vacuum, it doesn't even make sense then. I don't see how this woman got elected. I just don't understand it. But anyway, she was also, because there is, again, so much, so much stupidity coming out of, of such a small little body. So much stupidity coming out of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She was also tweeting earlier today about the prices of croissants in the airport. No, I promise I'm not making this up. This is real. So this was was her thing that happened today. Um, 
Croissants at LaGuardia are going for $7 a piece. Shock face. Yet some people think getting a whole hour of personal, dedicated human labor for $15 is too expensive? And double question marks. Don't ask why. I, I have no idea. So the $7 a piece thing bothers her. And she's saying that that is justification for there being $15 an hour minimum wage. There are several problems with this. First of all, Washington Free Beacon actually did a fact check, and it turns out that croissants go for about $3.50 a piece in LaGuardia Airport, and the minimum wage in LaGuardia Airport is already $15 an hour. <laughs> and the average airport worker at LaGuardia makes $19 an hour. Which, by the way, $3.50, even though it's much better than $7, $3.50 is an insane amount for a croissant. Go down to Publix Bakery. You can get like, I, th I think you can actually get a baker's dozen, so 13 croissants, which are delicious, by the way. I had to eat a lot of them when I was on chemo because it was like the only thing I could eat that didn't make me nauseous. So <laughs> you can buy like 13 croissants for, I believe, $2, maybe $2.50. So yes, $3.50 for a single croissant is ridiculous. It's not quite $7 like AOC thinks, but it is a lot of money. So let's ask ourselves, put on our thinking caps. Hmm. What could make the price of croissant so insanely high? Maybe the fact that there's a $15 an hour minimum wage in LaGuardia. Maybe that the average airport worker is making 19 bucks an hour. Maybe that's why the price of croissants is insane there. Maybe it also has to do with the fact that you have a government-controlled monopoly inside an airport. Why? Because when you pass through security, you can't exactly go somewhere else. So they essentially have a micro-monopoly where there's very limited competition within the airport itself to be able to do that. Now, you have to compete with other restaurants in the airport, obviously, but that's a much smaller pool than having to compete with the entire general public. And so the reason that air fo airport food is so much more expensive than regular food is that they create a little micro -mono a monopoly there in the airport. Because they know the people can't leave and they know they don't want to have to leave security and go somewhere else. And because of that, they're able to charge more than they normally would. That combined with the fact that these people are making $15 an hour to make croissants might have something to do with the reason that your croissant price is insane. So let's also look at, in response to this, once several people pointed out that she was completely wrong about this, instead of saying, whoops, guys, I made a mistake, or showing any kind of humility at all, or self-correction, she, of course, did what AOC always does, which is play the victim. So she's saying, the GOP taking every tweet so earnestly is making my point for me. It's not an argument against the price of a croissant. It's about the value of human worth. But I guess the idea is foreign to them since their policies treat people as disposable anyway. Okay, so let's break that down. She's saying that the argument is not at the price of the croissant. So in other words, she's saying, okay, well, they proved me wrong that the croissant's not actually $7. And so I'm going to say, well, it was never about the croissant. Well, if it's not, then why did you bring it up? That was the whole point of the last tweet. If you take out the price of the croissant, the tweet doesn't make any sense. So what she's doing here is backpedaling after she was made a fool of by people just reading her tweet and showing that it was incorrect. And so she tries to backpedal that, and then she's making an argument about, well, the thing is, even though I was completely wrong, it's not an argument about the croissant, it's about the value of human life. Okay, well, that's weird for a number of reasons. First of all, the big logical fallacy that you're committing here is that you're conflating two things that are not the same thing. The value of a human life is not equivalent to the value of that person's labor. And this is easily provable. In fact, I did this on Twitter in response to this. One of the things that I mentioned here is I gave this example. A person's life is not equivalent to the value of their labor. Let's say that there's a barber. And let's say he's a really good barber. He's so good that he charges 100 bucks a haircut. Okay, well, the thing is, I don't want that haircut because it's too expensive. 
just too rich for me. I, I'll have to go somewhere else to get my hair cut. I'm sure he's a fine barber, but his because he's putting such a high price on it, his labor is essentially worthless to me because I'm saying, I don't value your labor enough to pay you that much, which is essentially what an employer says when somebody comes to him demanding $15 an hour for flipping hamburgers. He's saying, no, no, your labor is not worth $15 an hour to me, so I'm going to have to go a different direction. I'm going to have to go with somebody cheaper or automate or something else. But my point is, what you are saying when you don't accept that term is that you're saying your your labor is not valuable enough to me for me to pay that to you. So in this analogy, if there's this barber who's charging 100 bucks for styling my hair, I would have to say, nope, sorry, can't do it. Your your labor is not that valuable to me. However, if I'm standing in that barber shop and some crazy person jumps in there with a gun and tries to shoot the guy, I don't know for whatever reason. I would like to think, I don't know this for sure, because it's hard to tell unless you've been in that situation. But I would like to think that I would probably dive in front of the gun trying to save this man's life. Because that's what I'm supposed to do as a Christian. I'm supposed to give of myself to other people. I'm supposed to love other people more than I love myself. And so, his life is worth more to me than my own. That's not the same thing as saying that his labor is as valuable to me as my own. Because his labor is not worth $100 to me, but his life is. And this is actually something that I find so hilarious about the arguments on the left. Because when we hear anti-capitalist arguments, one of the first things we always hear is, well, a person's value shouldn't just be uh, determined by how much that they can make. Their value, their value as people shouldn't be determined about what they can do in the labor market. And then you have Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez coming out and saying the exact opposite. She's saying that a person's life value and the value of their labor is exactly the same thing. And if you're not paying people enough for their labor, it means you don't value them as people. That's not necessarily true. For example, I don't get manicures. So a manicurist their labor is literally worth zero to me. I would not pay them a quarter to manicure because I don't want one. But just because their labor is not valuable to me doesn't mean that they are not valuable to me. It doesn't mean that I think that they're useless as a person. It doesn't mean that I think they're subhuman. It just means that I don't want whatever particular labor they're selling. And so they're conflating these two ideas of human value and the value of their labor as being one and the same, despite the fact that they are usually the party that constantly accuses Republicans of doing that, that constantly accuses conservatives and libertarians of doing that, even though we don't. We understand that there is a distinction there, that a person's value and the value of a person's labor is not the same thing. And here's another thing that really hacks me off. At the end of that, she says that their policies, talking about the GOP, all their policies treat people as though they're disposable. And yet, she supports policies, and she's from the state of New York and their new abortion law, which she prays, where you can literally pull a person apart and throw them in a garbage can. Do not preach to me about treating people as though they are disposable. That is just so incredibly infuriating. But I have to say, AOC is on to us. The jig is up. She figured out our plan. That tweet that I read to you a second ago, where she was talking about there is a concentrated far right-wing propaganda machine with a whole cable news channel and dark money, uh, dark money internet operation and the Mercers, so all of these different things are coming together to malign her and discredit her. And that's the reason that she's getting all of this heat from the media and from these other sources. She's on to us. She's on to us. We all got together and had a big meeting. And I was part of it. That's the reason that I keep bringing her up in the Daily Dose of Stupid. We all got together and we formulated a plan of how to malign and discredit Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And even though I'm not supposed to, don't tell anybody, 
I'm going to tell you what the plan was. Okay, here it goes. I'm going to read it in its entirety. Step one, let her talk. Step two, show unedited clips of her talking. That's it. And this is what's so hilarious about this is that she tr constantly plays herself as the victim. That she doesn't know how to handle criticism, so she assumes that everybody is out to get her whenever something terrible goes, uh, terrible happens to her. People don't think that she's stupid because she's actually stupid and says dumb things on a routine basis. The reason that people don't like her is because that they're either racist or sexist or whatever else it is. Some kind of victim status that she claims. And that really is her only defense. It's the only one that she knows how to fall back on. And she's so incredibly dense that all you have to do to defeat her is let people hear her talk. That is the best defense against Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And it's one that I and other conservatives employ on a regular basis, and that's the reason that people think she's not all that bright is because they've listened to her talk. All right, let's go on to the Chaplin's report. In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today comes from the book of Ezekiel. And it does play into what we were talking about earlier with the movie Unplanned. So I wanted to go ahead and take you to that. Uh, we'll go to Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 1 through 6. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the sons of your people and say to them, If I bring a sword upon the land, and the people of the land take one man among them and make, and make the, him their watchman, and he sees the sword coming upon the land and blows the trumpet and warns the people, then he who hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning and a sword comes to take him away, his blood will be on his own head. He that heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning, his blood will be on himself. But had he taken warning, he would be delivered of his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet and the people are not warned, a sword comes and takes the person from them, he is taken away in his iniquity but his blood I will require from the watchman's hand. So essentially what's going on here, and, and the Bible makes it very clear, God holds his people accountable. When he gives us a job to do, he expects us to do it. And one of the things that we, as Christians and members of his kingdom, are tasked with doing, just like Ezekiel, is to warn people about God's judgment to warn them that things are going to happen if they don't repent, if they don't stop what they're doing. This was Ezekiel's time. This was Ezekiel's task. When he lived, Israel was replete with sin. And it was Ezekiel's job, because God told him to do it, to go out and warn people. And he gives this parable of the watchman, saying that as long as Ezekiel does his job, whatever happens, happens. As long as Ezekiel goes out and tells people the error of their ways, he can't make them change. He can't make them listen to him. But he did his job. But he's saying, if my watchman, if my watchman sees the sword coming, and he sees that bad things are on the horizon, and doesn't do anything to warn anybody, then not only his blood, but the blood of every person he refused to warn is on his head which is a terrifying thought, but it is based in biblical truth. And that's one of the reasons that I think that this movie is so important is because a lot of Christians, I think, have been far too silent on abortion for a long time. And not just the issue of abortion itself and declaring it wrong, which of course it is, 
but also that we haven't warned people what is going to happen if we continue down this path, if we continue to sacrifice the lives of our children in hopes of convenience or freedom from responsibility. Because the reckoning is coming. And I do believe that if we repent, if we turn around, that maybe that reckoning can be stayed. And as David once said, God's mercies are endless, and who knows when he will be merciful. But in this matter, I do think that it is the responsibility of every Christian to warn people that God is not happy with our behavior as a nation when it comes to this issue. And that bad things are going to happen if we don't turn it around. But here's the thing. Maybe some people won't listen. Maybe some people are going to ignore us. Call us crazy, call us zealots, whatever. There are going to be people that do that. But when that reckoning comes, if we did our job, their blood is on their own hand. We gave them the warning. We sounded the trumpet. We did everything that we could to warn them that something was going to happen if they didn't change. But all we are is watchmen. We can't make the people evacuate. All we can do is ring the alarm. And as long as we do our job, God will be satisfied with us, no matter what happens to everything around us. Obviously, we want to save people. Obviously, we want to change them. We want to convert them. We want them to know how much God loves them and wants them to stop their sinful lifestyles and behavior. But the bottom line is, even if they don't, that's their choice. All we have to do is sound the alarm, and we'll be in God's favor. Whether or not they listen to us is really up to them, and of course we pray for them. But ultimately, we have to remember that as Christians, all we are is watchmen. Stay the course, friends. Tactics is a production of News Radio 1440 and Cumulus Media Montgomery. Any opinions expressed on this program are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Cumulus Media. The theme song for Tactics is Six Foot Town by Big and Rich. Graphics by Jessica Dawson. Broadcast studios provided by Cumulus Media Montgomery. Location studios provided by the Dalreda Church of Christ. Copyright 2019.